like to start the class with a prayer this morning. I'm going to ask Brother Bruce Rosenblum, if he would, to lead us in a prayer to begin. Just go over some things about the book of James as we begin this morning before we get into any textual study. Um, <clears throat> First of all, how many chapters are in the book of James? Five? Okay, so we're dealing with a fairly short book. It uh, should go quicker than some of our other studies. But um, what can you say about the book of James? Um, besides that it has five chapters. Practical. That's uh, usually something that keeps coming up every time you read some material from somebody or, you know, you get a classroom study book about it. It's going to mention that James is very practical. Uh, that, That lets us know that it's something that we can find very useful for ourselves today. It's not something that is, um, you know, so written to a certain group that has particular meaning, although most of the scripture that we find, even written to certain cities or churches or individuals, we still find a lot of uh, God's truth in there that's applicable to us that we can use and and, and, um, make applications and help our lives a little bit too, but it's a very practical book. Well, who is it written to? Scattered Christians. Um, don't know exactly what that means. Uh, James uses the terminology to scatter the 12 tribes. Scattered 12 tribes. Now, you know, that might have reference to, uh, to Israel in general. Um, if you look at the timing of the writing of the book, it's thought to have been written in the time frame of anywhere from 45, uh, AD 45 to maybe even 50 by some some scholars. So when was the church established? AD 33. So you're looking at, you know, something that's uh, 12, 15, 16, some few years after the church. And of course we know that there was great persecution that arose because of Saul among others and uh, they scattered. Now that, you know, Perhaps that's written to those who are scattered. Um, It's not really clear to us who exactly that is. But when you get the idea that it's written to scattered Christians, it's the idea that uh, the scattering took place not because they got jobs off in another city and just sort of uh, migrated toward a certain direction, but the idea that they were being scattered uh, in terms of persecution. So, very practical book written to people who are indeed in trouble are suffering some difficulties uh, you know and uh, not much uh, different from the study we just got through with the the Hebrew Christians who were being uh, persecuted in some ways but uh, we see here that it's written to uh, that group of people and as a result of that uh, it usually falls into the category of what people call a general epistle uh, that is not written to a particular a group or congregation like first corinthians first second corinthians you know or first and second timothy written to timothy or to titus and or the galatians ephesians or philippians those kind of things where they're written to specific congregations in a particular locale james is a general epistle because he's writing to those christians who are scattered and um so who is this James? There are about three James that are mentioned in the 
the Bible. There's James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. There is also James that was known uh, as the son of Alphaeus. He was called James the Less. And then there's another James, the brother of Christ. And uh, so all indications are that this particular writer is the brother of Christ. Now, it's interesting uh, if you go back and, and look at your history just a little bit uh, about James and his family and his relationship to his brother, their, their relationship to their brother. What can you say about uh, their relationship um, or how should I say it, uh, how, James, how, what, how James perceived Jesus? at least in the time that we read about in the Gospels. Okay. It appears from all the writings that it wasn't until after the resurrection of Jesus that his family, uh, now maybe not his mother, but other members of his family really believed that he was the Christ. Even though they had been around him and seen things, they were skeptical, even his own family. And uh, so it, it is interesting that as James starts this particular book in James chapter 1, he calls himself a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in all uh, respects, he could have said, James, the son of God, uh, the servant of God and the brother of Jesus Christ, couldn't he? But... I think there is an attitude change that took place in James after his realization that Jesus was, in fact, the cross. And uh, he looks upon himself then as a servant uh, to him. So that's, that's somewhat that's something that's fairly, fairly interesting. Um, we see that, that James deals a lot with um, moral issues, too. We talk about the practicality of it, but he deals a lot with moral issues. How do you treat people? And how do you conduct yourself? And we're going to see that come out as we talk about uh, this, particular, this particular book. Now, what's one thing that James deals a lot with? What one topic? Okay. Okay, he deals with faith a lot, and he tells us he gives the James gives the most practical uh, understanding of what faith has to encompass. Now, when you talk about Paul talking about faith, we see him talk about things, uh, but not to where he gets on the same plane that James does to talk about how faith has to be brought about or what has to be involved in faith. And we're going to see that and talk about that in chapter two. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why he has reference to the scatter, scatter of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, I think that's the indication here. It's not, it wouldn't appear to be written to the Gentiles but it would have been, appeared to have been written to the scattered Israelites or scattered of the 12th tribe, the Jews. Yes, yes, because, you know, that was uh, certainly um, a drastic change. If you were a Jew and then all of a sudden you believed in Christ, there was still a lot of animosity and the majority of Jews that did not believe in Christ, did not accept the gospel. So you, you have already a, a strained relationship. And then, of course, they sought to kill or to punish those people who follow Christ. And that's the prime example we see of Saul and what he tried to do. So uh, that's what it would appear to, to address, those who were scattered. The scattering, not really clear, but I think it probably has to do with the early persecution of the church because of the time of the writing of this particular book. And um, there are a number of things that, that James deals with. And uh, one of the things that, if you look in your book, he talks about a number of things. 
It says the purpose of this book is, or this particular study is to encourage the brethren to remain faithful and live righteously. We see that throughout. Um, now, as we look through the, the introduction of the book, we see how there are a number of things that are addressed in uh, chapter 1 that deal with uh, living with temptations and trials. And we'll look at that as we get into it. Uh, and then as he finishes up chapter 1, he talks about faith in action. What does it take? What is, how do you put your faith into action? Or what, is it, what demonstrates that you have faith? And uh, then in, in chapter 2, we talk about how to treat one's fellow man. Uh, and also we deal with faith and works in chapter 2. Chapter 3, we're going to talk about faith and the use of the tongue. And uh, we talked about that uh, as interesting study in and of itself. Chapter 4, faith versus the world and the remedy for worldliness. And um, as, as we talk about the scriptures and, you know, I, I, this is my perception. So I wouldn't take it to the bank, but... You can think about it and you have your own thoughts. But we live in a world today and we think, well, we're, you know, the world is totally different than the way it was back then. Well, I, I don't see it that way. I think the world uh, influenced by Satan is the world. And if you talk about things that are happening today, you think, well, they didn't, there's no way that happened back then. Well, yeah, it did. Um, I mean, how, how much brazen, more brazen can you get uh, in terms of people that are homosexuals today who come out and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to come out of the closet and tell everybody I'm a homosexual. How more brazen can you be, get than go back to the story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah where the men came to knock on the door and says, give us your visitors so that we may know them. That's pretty brazen, isn't it? Broad daylight. Uh, so I don't think that we see the world has changed much. Uh, we have modern technology. Maybe things are more readily available at our fingertips in terms of information and knowledge, but sin is sin. And it has been in the world since the very early time of man, and it, man's evil thoughts are cultivated. We're going to see the results of that, and that's what we see as he addresses here. It's not going to be much different. So when we talk about the worldliness and the evil that's there because of sin, those things are applicable today. And uh, it's not like, well, that happened back then. And People who make those statements don't understand the Scriptures. That's, that's about all I can say. If you make the statement that, oh, this book, yeah, it was written, it's, t it's 2,000 years old, it's out of date, it doesn't address anything for us today, we shouldn't pay any attention to it, maybe it's a good book to read, then they don't understand. And uh, so James is going to deal with some things in here, some worldliness issues that we need to pay attention to. And then he talks in chapter 5 about the rich and their attitudes. And, uh, man, we live in a materialistic world, don't we? So we've got that today, too. That's why James is so practical. You could take the book of James... And you could sort of uh, adjust the setting just a little bit and plop it right down in today's society and it would be applicable. And that's amazing. It's amazing. Because, as I said, there are people today who say, well, you know, it just really doesn't have any value for us today. So we're going to see the rich in their attitudes. And then in chapter 5 he talks about speech, prayer, and confession. And uh, some other things that we're going to deal with um, as we get into that. There are five great lessons that this, this uh, writer of our textbook wants to uh, bring home to us. That is that God's promises help. Uh, they do not exempt in times of trouble. There's not something that says, okay, because I'm a Christian and I'm following God, then I'm not going to have problems. And that's going to be apparent as we get into chapter 1. Then he addresses how that faith only will not save. Faith only will not save. 
And uh, the Bible clearly teaches that, but there are people today who say, well, all you do is believe, you know, and that's, that's all you got to do. You just accept Jesus and believe you're, you're good and you don't uh, have to conduct yourself a certain way. And James refutes that. And then he talks about the, another great lesson. There's too much worldliness in the church. Now, that starts hitting close to home. Too much worldliness in the church. And then another lesson is an effort must be made to restore the erring. And then finally, the fifth great lesson we want to try to learn is that God requires that we be honest and maintain our integrity. It's like uh, if you all remember the old uh, Dallas uh, primetime soap opera, about all it was. J.R. Ewing, who was... uh, about as bad as you can get as far as moral says, when you give up your integrity, what do you say? The rest of it's a piece of cake. So we're going to talk about that. We need to maintain our integrity as we live our Christian lives. Okay, there are some challenging themes that he wants to address in this uh, particular study. He says, based on the summation word, that is the word faith, we didn't touch on that, but that's what his summation word is. And the key passage, which is James 1, 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. He says, This book produces ten great challenging themes, two from each chapter. When the themes and supporting scriptures are studied, one's faith is fortified, his conviction of truth is solidified, and the reality of the problem of sin is clearly seen. Now, the first couple of things that we're going to address... Uh, in chapter 1 are the temptations and trials will come but God has promised to see us through them verses 1 through 18 and then part B of chapter 1 is that the Bible is the only perfect standard of right and wrong we're going to touch on that so let's go ahead and get started into the textual study uh, of the book of James and let's uh, see where we get to today and we will um, Put a bookmark there, and then we'll continue next week. First of all, James identifies himself in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when I read that, and hopefully when you read it, what kind of an attitude do you think that conveys? Just that opening statement. If I write something to you and I, and I address you as your servant... What have I done to myself? I've, I've humbled myself. I've, I've said I'm submissive to you. I, I feel like that I'm serving you in some way. I'm not above you. I'm not someone who is standing, looking over you and saying, look, you need to do this or do that because I know what's right. You do it. James is saying, hey, I'm a servant. I'm a servant of God. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. And, I am, and so I am writing to you in a spirit of humility telling you what you need to know. Now, that's one of the hardest things in my mind to do is to go tell somebody that there are things that you need to address in your lives. Now, you imagine that. You're going to go up to somebody and say, I need to talk to you about your life. Well, what kind of of feelings do you have going on? How do you think, as you approach that, what are your feelings? You... It's a difficult task, isn't it? I mean, you're going to go tell someone else what they need to do to take care of their lives. First of all, what do you normally have to do? Reflect on your own life. And I think James is, you know, is in that mindset. He's, he's a, it's a matter of humility. Uh, he says, uh, Here a servant of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, writing to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, and he greets them. And he says, I... I need to write to you. I have some things that are important to be written to you. And so I think we see a a matter uh, of a relationship of humility as he writes to these brethren. And I think that would would make me stand up and take notice if I got that kind of greeting as opposed to, you need to really clean your life up, you know. So I think James is approaching it in the right manner. These people are having difficulties and he is identifying with them as one of the servants of Jesus Christ. 
someone who is trying to serve God and the Son in the manner in which they have requested and that knows that there are difficulties that are coming their way. He says, my brethren, and that is an endearing term. We see it written in a number of places, but here James uses the same kind of terminology, my brethren. That means I am with you in this difficulty that you're suffering under. I am, I am supporting you. I am trying to, to encourage you. Uh, I'm not writing it as someone who is an authoritative source that says, here, go fix your lives. I'm writing it as one of you. And so it's an endearing term that he uses, my brethren. And then he says, count it all joy when you fall into divers or manifold temptations. Now, if you're receiving this letter and you're suffering persecutions and trials on every hand, how do you receive that? Hard, wouldn't it? Yeah. You want me to count it joy when I fall into these temptations? And so, obviously, uh, James, without saying it, saying, read on. Come to an understanding of what I'm saying. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, notice there's some things that are interesting here. First of all, to count. What, what, what does that mean to you to count? To, to accept it, to understand what, what we're dealing with, the idea of accrediting it. Uh, you know, if you are trying to, uh, to, to provide record of something, not from the standpoint of writing it down, but from the idea of to, to uh, consider it... Uh, for something that you should measure or uh, to to try to come to a grasp of. I don't know if that's uh, if I'm doing really good justice to that. Yeah. I find it uh, interesting, um, I think as, uh, as you grow older, you get a little bit more uh, aware. Maybe it's because people around you are, are bringing it to your attention. Maybe it's sometime because your demeanor and the way you're addressing something. But I find it interesting that the, as I get older, I, I see things in a little bit different perspective. Um, you know, you're, uh, let's just say, for example, you, you go out in the parking lot uh, after services today, and let's say it's still raining and you have a flat tire. <sighs> That's that, that bothers you, doesn't it? How many times have you been riding around over the last year and you didn't have a flat tire? And yet, what do we focus on? I had a flat tire. I'm just so down, you know. Well, what about the, all the times you drove around to different places in the last year and you didn't have a flat tire? We don't think like that, do we? And, and as I get older, I, I think I have a, a help meet that uh, tends to, to make me think about those things a little bit more when I, you know, here it is. I'm struggling through something else. Well, look at all the times you didn't have to struggle through that or look at all the times it was positive and I think we have to really step back and, and look at things like that um, and so when you look at, at counting something that's bad I think uh, maybe the message here that James is 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 talking about and he goes he's going to go on and explain this obviously we're, we're sort of uh, talking about this term of counting but if we were to put on a balance of debts and credits, for example, we would look at that and say, well, that's bad. You know, and, and, but, but here's the thing. If we were to put it on a balance beam, here's something bad that's happened to me. 
how much effort will we make or would our minds help us to understand all the positive things that outweigh that? Now, what James is going to do is go on here in just a, a couple more sentences and explain how this benefits us even though it is considered as negative. And, and yet, our thinking oftentimes is, well, something bad happened to me. Well, the scales are way down. Well, and I'm waiting for something good to come along. And uh, so we, we look at every day and, you know, we don't have difficulty during those days. Do we count those days as positive? No. We're waiting for the next negative thing to come along to weigh that scale down a little more. Look at something else that's happened to me. I think that sort of what James is is getting at here is there's some positive things that are going to come from things that happen to you. We're going to see that. But we need to be in the mindset that we understand those negative things in terms of our positive things and how that our positive things so so much outweigh our negative things. And so, yeah, there's going to be some things that happen to you and that you're going to be aggravated about and have to deal with. Uh, but most of these things are sort of petty um, because in the sense of where they stand in importance to everything going on in the world, those are just irritations. But now he's going to try to get them to understand that you need to count these things that are happening to you as joy. Well, that, that's difficult. My brethren count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations. The pleasure of those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you and others who revile and persecute you, and render all kinds of evil against you false on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So, similar vein there. Yeah, exactly. And, and you ask yourself, well, how can you rejoice in those things that are bad? This is bad. We don't rejoice in bad things. But let's look at what James says as he goes on here. My brethren, can it all joy when you fall into divers temptations? Now, notice that he is not talking in terms of, okay, you've had a bad day. Or something bad's happened to you. Notice what he says here. Fall into divers or manifold or many temptations. Count it joy that these things are happening to you. It's like, how do you count that as joy? Well, let's read on. Knowing this, why, why can you count this as joy? Knowing this, that what? That the trying of your faith worketh patience. Worketh patience. Now, I don't know quite how to explain this, but I know uh, many of you have probably had to do some mechanical work sometime in your life. Maybe not you ladies. I hope you hadn't had to do it. I hope you had somebody to help you do it. But you guys know what I'm talking about. You've got this ornery bolt or something that won't come out. You aggravate with that. You do everything, it snaps off, you have to get something to get it out, you've got to drill, you've got to get an easy out, you've got to do whatever you can to get that out. Now let me ask you a question, that was difficult and problematic, but when you got it out, what did you feel like? I'm good to go now, I got it going, success. Now, how many times have you done something like that and the reason that something happened is because you, you didn't follow a good process to get something done. And so you, how many times have you ever put something together and didn't read the instructions? 
only to find out that that piece you left out was about six or seven steps back and you have to undo everything. I find that when I was younger, I would have problems with something like that. It would make me mad. I just like, like to get a sledgehammer and beat something. But if you're trying to protect something or repair something and you take a sledgehammer to it, chances are you're not going to be able to use it. So you learn that over time you've got to be patient. There are certain things that you do and certain things that you don't do. And how many times have we learned from something that we've done? Oh, I did this before. You know what's frustrating to me? Hey, I did this before, but I don't remember what I did before. And so I experience the problems all over again. And about the time I get through with them, then I realize, you know, I remember that now. I wasn't supposed to have done it that way. But I can't remember it next time. Yeah. The, um, the idea here that James is trying to convey is not necessarily that the temptations and trials of life are something that we should pleasure over. But we have to recognize that these things make us stronger. They make us to be able to handle things. I, I take it um, well, I David could probably address this to some degree but how many times do people come into something like wanting to be a firefighter and then you see them on the through the, the, the things that they have to go through to be able to qualify and they just like I don't know if I can make this I don't know if I can make this well they start out at this point right here and, and we're thankful that when they end up, they're up here because we need people that are totally trained and have certain attitudes to be able to be our firefighters, policemen, and whatever, right? So when you start out, I say, well, it's a little bit difficult. What happens if, we, if, if James is writing to a bunch of people who say, oh, I've had a couple of difficult things happen to me. I'm just going to give it up and quit. What if we accepted that in, in our in our servicemen that helped us with the fighting fires and our policemen. We said, well, you know, <laughs> recognize this is a little difficult. We'll just back off and make it easier. It's, it doesn't, it's no good, you know. We put firefighters out there that don't have the stamina to fight a fire. Well, we just might as well not even go on there to begin with. And so you've got to understand that if, if you are, as a Christian, are suffering persecution, it's going to cause you to grow. Your faith's going to grow. If I can accomplish something, I, I see people today, and it's a little bit, um, I mean, I understand how it happens. But there are people who've never developed. They've never reached the potential that they could reach because... Something in their life was a little difficult, and instead of saying, okay, I think I can overcome this, they let that defeat them. And as a result of that, they don't have the ability today that they could have because they didn't persevere. You get to those points because you're willing to, to 
take do what it takes to to overcome these things. Now, as you look at this, we see it in practical everyday life, but let's look at it in terms of the church that are the the scattered Christians that uh, James is writing to here. If the church in the early days during persecution had said, this is just about more than I can handle, I'm going to give it up. Where would we be today? We wouldn't be here. It just wouldn't have happened. And and so when you start talking about um, what it takes, it takes perseverance. And so James is saying, count it joy because, not that it's enjoyable, but count it joy because knowing that when you are tried, that this trying of your faith produces patience. You can make it. You can endure things that come in your life. And um, they'll make you a better person. Now, why do we test kids in school? Why do we test them? We want them to grow, don't we? We want them to be able to, to, to work at something, to grow, to be able to go to the next level. And, and as Christians, our goal ought to be to always be able to go to the next level. And it doesn't really matter what age we are. If there are difficulties in our lives, we need to understand how to let that help us to become stronger. Now, what happens to a piece of metal that has been tested and tried in the fire? What happens to it? It gets stronger. It becomes harder, doesn't it? It becomes such that it can withstand blows or can deliver blows or, you know, like we take... Uh, we take a hammer, for example. A hammer is hardened metal. If it wasn't hardened metal and we hit it the first time, it just wasn't properly treated, it's just going to be useless. I used it one time and it's gone. That's not worth anything, is it? And, and so we're talking about things that have been tried and tested and they become hardened. Not hardened in the sense that they uh, have no feelings, but hardened in the sense that they're tough enough to be able to withstand and that's what it's going to take for the Christians. And so James says, don't, don't worry about this. Don't worry about the fact that you're falling into these various temptations. But count them as joy because you need to understand that when you go through this, this process, you become stronger. And, and that's something that obviously we need to understand today. Our difficulties are not, we may live in the modern age, but our difficulties are still going to be there. We're still going to suffer through those. And we need to understand that those things can make us stronger. And so we, ex- we accept the idea that they're going to be there and we work at it and we're going to grow through that process. So he teaches them then that the, the trying of your faith is going to produce patience. And um, it says then, verse 4, but let patience have her perfect work. And when we talk about perfection here, or perfect work here, what are we talking about? Complete. I haven't reached or I haven't obtained all that I can obtain. So let patience have a perfect work. Let patience uh, be something that we uh, allow to happen in our lives so that we can get to a point where we're complete. That we have been able to reach our goal. So he says, let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect or complete and entire wanting nothing. Have you ever talked to older people who have um, been through a number of things and they have survived and because of that they have, they have matured to a certain level and you say, well, what do you, what do you need in your life? How many do you normally find that says, well, you know, I I want a brand new house or I want a brand new car? Do you really usually find people like that who've been through the trials? Are they not typically satisfied with what they have? What I've got is good. I've worked hard to get get them and I've had to struggle through things and what I've got is good. Well, you could have something so much more value. I don't care. Don't necessarily want all these glittery things out here. 
because I've matured to the point where I'm, I'm good with what I've got. Yeah, I think our, I think we have, uh, we have good goals. We have things we want to strive for. We have levels that we want to obtain. We need to recognize that those things are not going to happen if we don't push forth to get there. I mean, you look at the, our whole history of, of the nature of what we are as a nation. Do you think if we had to come to the difficulties of the trip to the West that we would have ever this nation would have been what it is I don't think it would have been the same and so when you look at people that are people in history that go down to being uh, significant um, people that we look to as we look up to I guess they had to really persevere to do what they did. If you look at some of the stories of uh, Columbus and uh, Ponce de Leon and some of the others who were explorers and things that they went through, you go out not knowing where you're going. You don't know what you're going to find. You have great difficulty. You've got crews that want to mutiny. You've got sickness. You've got uh, all kinds of storms that you have to traverse to get through. Yeah, all this to do what has happened in our history. It's not been easy. But it's what the idea that we need to move on beyond that that lets us be sort of unique. Now, you uh, think of that in terms of spiritual terms. Here we have persecuted Christians. They're scattered, no doubt, because of persecution. What's going to happen if they don't endure? The church is not going to be what it is today. It's not going to go out into the world. They're not going to be able to reach people. Um, things would, would fall apart. And, and I want you to think about this for, for just a minute. Uh, we sing a song in our books about it, but uh, what happens if the followers of Christ just say, you know, this is just too tough of a life? I mean, Christ did not come in and say, hey, I'm going to establish the church, and then if the church has difficulties, I'm going to come in, and through divine intervention, I'm going to cause the church to become what it needs to be. That wasn't the plan. The plan, which is amazing, if you stop and think about it, the divine plan, although given a good jump start in the early stages of the church through the miracles and the things that were there to confirm the word was basically after a short time turned over to human hands and it's like it's up to you to maintain this and we have that challenge today it is up to us to continue on to persevere so that the church can continue to grow and that's, that's God's desire and plan. It's not for us to say, okay, we've had a, had a good run here in Maysville for so many years, and, you know, after we reach so many years, let's just call it quits. That's not what it's about. It's not like a ball player retiring or some corporation shutting down. This is about continuation of the gospel of God's plan, and it's in human hands. And so if James can't get these people to understand to be able to rise above the difficulties, the church is, is uh, in peril. And so it's imperative that they understand how it's going to be. It's going to be difficult. And we need to understand that. Uh, we need to understand there's going to be difficulties. We need to understand we have to push through because we want to please God. Next week we'll pick up here about verse 4 or 5 and... Uh, continue on and um, see what James has to say about difficulties and temptations. Appreciate everybody being here.